Hey. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Regan, and I'm a relationship expert and coach, and I'm also a certified mediator and a seasoned family and couple therapist in San Francisco Bay Area, and I run a lot of groups. And I just wanted to introduce you to who I'm speaking with today, which is Chelsea Owens. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on a call with me. Of course. I was hoping that you could tell people a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am a marriage and family therapist as well. And uh, I'm also a board certified art therapist. Um, so uh, primarily how I work, um, how I've been trained is um, in art therapy, um, which is kind of just another modality of um, utilizing a, a way of getting to know yourself in therapy. It's this kind of other third thing um, that's in the room with you, um, which I have found to be uh, tremendously helpful mm -hmm. um, working with younger populations as well, um, just to have this kind of other, other thing um, to be able to express uh, your emotions and understand your emotions a little bit better. Mm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And that's, I think that's one thing that drew me to you. And I, I, I wanted to tell people how we, we know each other. Yeah. So um, we've been collaborating for about a year and a half now on cases. I, I see a lot of parents that are going through divorce and separation and often their kids are having a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And so we've gotten the opportunity to, to really do some good family work together where, um, I might be seeing the parents and sometimes the kids are coming in to have their own voice about the separation and what they need in order to feel stable. And then you've been able to, to work also with more deeply with the child and the parent if there's other places where they really feel like they're not getting the emotional support that they need. So yeah. it's been an amazing, um, unique kind of connection that we've gotten to, to have because we've worked a, a few families into having a, a, a better, like less traumatic separation and more of a healthy transition to yeah. deeper relationships with their parents. So, so one of the things yeah, that been... Chelsea and I were brainstorming the other day on a on talk was uh, a call that we were having about how we could help parents, especially in this time of COVID, to deal with some of their um, teenage and tween kids in the situation because kids are having a hard time. And one of the ways that I've I've been noticing that kids are having a hard time as they're shutting down and, um, and trying to figure out like how to help. I, I try to figure out how to help the parent deal with that. And you're trying to help the kids deal with um, that probably also in the parents trying to gain some strategies about what's going on. Um, how are you handling parents that are really struggling with um, being able to communicate with their kids and also thinking that their kids are struggling yeah. and not, not really being able to figure out how to, how to talk to them. How, how are you yeah. that on both sides? Yeah. Cause there's, there's, you know, first of all, like just what they're going through developmentally, right? Like during the adolescent teen years, there's already all of the things that um, are coming up from the, you know, the transforming changes every day. Right. And then throw on top of that. Now we're quarantined and, we're all in the same house together all the time. And so it's just, and now especially it feels like we're just kind of in this Petri dish and the magnifying glass is like over us, you know, and, and everything's just being amplified, right? All the problems, um, you know, all the uncomfortable stuff, it's all kind of coming up now. And there isn't a lot of space to even move around or have privacy, right? Um, so I think it's important um, especially if parents are feeling like their, their teens are shutting down, um, not talking to them about something. Uh, I, I just want to normalize that too. Like during this time developmentally, it's not uncommon for kids to, um, to, to have this emerging autonomy, right? They're, they're kind of developing um, who they are, differentiating from parents and just isolating a little bit more. And, you know, I, I, all the adults um, have been through this period of being a teenager before. So, you know, they can at least some, at some point relate like, oh yeah, you know, I've been there myself and understand like what is going on for their kids. Um, so I think it's, it's just not uncommon for kids to kind of pull away and 
um, keep to themselves a little bit. And I think that can be really difficult for parents because they, you know, could be concerned that there is more going on that they're not talking about. Um, and yeah, and thinking that, um, that they, they want to get them uh, the help that, that they need. Uh, so I would hope that they would um, seek out, you know, therapy in, in that situation and make space for um, kids to have, have a little bit of privacy um, and let them know that they're there, that parents are there to, to process things and talk about things and hold space for, um, especially now, like any kind of anxiety or disappointment that they're experiencing, because there could be a lot of loss, you know, a lot of loss of the way things were, or we may not have graduation or prom, you know, all these things that parents can't really fix or replace. Um, but just letting them know that they validate their concerns and like their anxieties and um, that they're there, you know, if they, if they want to talk about it, that they're, they're there to listen. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important for parents to notice what's going on for them too, like noticing their own anxiety, their own kind of parts that are showing up. Um, because kids are also, you know, noticing everything that parents are doing and saying right now too. Um, noticing how their parents are handling all the anxiety and whatever's coming up. So um, noticing like, you know, if there's any catastrophic thinking or um, if parents are feeling really overwhelmed in the moment and kind of like, oh my gosh, this is never going to end. And, um, you know, because kids are probably feeling that too. And um, so, so knowing that, you know, mom and dad are okay, um, that they're, you know, doing the best that they can to handle the situation, handle their anxiety, I think could also kind of put kids at ease too. Mm -hmm. I like what you're saying is like, there's, there needs to be this understanding of firstly, like what it's like to be that age and for parents to really go back into thinking about that once in a while for themselves. Yeah. And they might've been a completely different tween or teenager. Totally. Um, yeah. And then, and then this is, this is something, this is a situation being put on their kids. So they have never done experienced this before. And so their isolation might be in reaction to that, but that the kids are really gonna be looking out and like with their antenna up, like how are my parents doing? Like if my parents can't handle this or can't talk about this, their stressors or they're acting their stressors out, then then this this is almost like something that I, they're, they're gonna to mimic too. Yeah. You know, it almost reminds me of like when, um, when you know, toddlers or young kids have, have big feelings and if their parents can't handle the big feelings the toddler's like well if my parents can't handle these big feelings and my feelings are bigger than my parents yeah and i'm not going to be able to handle these feelings too so it's almost like you know using the parents as the model yeah uh, of yeah. Uh, can we get through this and if i if i'm watching that you're getting through this and i have more hope to get through this exactly yeah and then and i don't want to say one more thing is like the intensity of the situation that, that in, there's an intensity that's being brought to the family. So anything that was like, just was a little bit hard to deal with, like, let's say your kid was spending a lot more time alone or not talking to you like they used to, like that's going to happen a little bit more because that's, it's, it's just going to get a little bit more intense right now. Yeah. yeah. And that's a normal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also, um, this uh, idea of trust is really important too um, for parents and for kids at this time. Um, as kids are, you know, in their teen years and kind of merging, um, emerging into this, like, what is it like to be an adult and how do I think for myself? And um, I think trust is a really, is a really important thing. Um, both trust of uh, that parents can trust that their kids, you know, are, are, um, able to make, you know, good decisions and, um, and kids need to feel like their parents trust them too. Um, and so I think that's also a really important thing to, to process or talk about or to notice for yourself as a parent and as, as a kid too, this feeling of like my parents trust that I can make my own decisions and, and also holding, um, as a parent holding, you know, loving boundaries too, because, um, you can trust, you know, have trust for your kids that they can make decisions on their own and 
um, and also hold like a loving boundary because kids, of course, still need boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Letting them know sort of what what to expect if they don't follow certain exactly. guidelines, yeah. right? Consequences. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then kids can trust that the parents are going to follow through with that. Exactly. And the parents mm -hmm. can trust that they understand that that's going to happen, and that they're also not going to be. I don't know if that's the right thing to say exactly, but not going to be um, always suspicious that they're doing something wrong. And I think that is really true. Is like that, like right. suspicion that your kid is doing something wrong is telling them you don't trust them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And f further to the point about um, kind of, I guess, shutting down and not talking or not, you know, wanting to talk. Um, I think it could be a really uh, interesting directive to have parents um, create like some kind of, I mean, you can get creative with this, but to have some kind of um, even a visual, like a meter, um, let's say like with a, a green light, meaning yes, I'm ready to talk or yellow light hesitant, but maybe I could talk red, like not feeling like talking um, to have something that's kind of uh, showing like where you're, where, where the kid's at right now, um, to know that so that parents can know like, okay, well, you know, this is where they're at. I won't push too hard right now. Or, um, you know, oh, okay, now they're ready to talk. Like now I can like come in with some, some inquisitive questions. Um, so something just to be creative, um, so that, so that also the kids can all feel like they're a part of, um, a part of, uh, like creating, um, you know, a, in this relationship, right? Um, so it's not just kind of like either the parent wants to talk and, um, mm -hmm. and then that kind of dictates what, what happens relationally, um, but to feel right. like partners in that. So I'm kind of playing it out in my head. Um, I think it's a good point is to almost give the parent some idea about like having um, a symbolic coding, say, yeah. That it doesn't, and so when it turns into the yes or no questions, like, um, and there no, doesn't seem like there's any give in the conversation, then you could say, hey, so what are you? Green, yellow, red, like what's, what's up with you right now? And if they yeah. say, I'm red, it's like, okay, got it. You're shut down. I'm not going to keep mm -hmm. pushing you. Mm -hmm. So that then the kid feels like they have more control over the back and forth and it's just not dictated by the parent and then feels like pressure, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I also think about this thing that one of my parents said to me is that they're so used to breaking their, their kid out of these times when they're really silent by going out and going, getting like a hamburger or going on an errand or, you know, and that broke them out of yeah. that. And now they don't have that option. So they're kind of, you know, stuck in the house, kids in the room, they're like knocking on the door. You want to do something? No, 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 there's nothing to do. Um, and I just wonder about, you know, that, when people are in, when a parent and, and a teen are in irons like that. Sure. Yeah. I think this is a great time to just, um, to be really creative about ways to engage each other and engage your relationship. I mean, just within, you know, it, it all depends on your resources, of course, but to have, um, things that like, what does your kid like to like to do? Like, what does engage your child in like the things that, that your child likes to do? Like, is it music? Like, ask questions about music. And um, if they want to learn something new, like try to do something together, learn a new skill, cook something together, start an art project, just get curious about what would it, uh, engage them? Like, what do they like to do? Um, and f focus on that necessarily, like my own agenda, like, this is what I like to do. Like, do you want to come do this thing with me? But really trying to get, you know, their buy-in, like, what is it that is going to light them up and, and feel good right now? And yeah, it may not be like leaving the house, right? So you may have to really get creative. And I think it's a good time to, to try to shift the emotional tone of the family or what the household is feeling, um, and try to inject like as much silliness or playfulness as you can right and that's like switching up anything like playing a game at the dinner table like dressing in weird clothes every other day mm -hmm. um yeah just trying to you know put sunglasses on the dog like things that are you know outside of the ordinary but um will just kind of helpfully shift the dynamic or shift the the emotional tone of how everyone's feeling um because it can feel so 
so stuck in, in, you know, um, in the, maybe the routine or lack of routine or just the, the new normal, which is just, you know, staying in my room all day. Um, but to really get creative about ways to, to try to engage and, and do things together. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that thing of, um, of noticing, you know, the gleam of positivity instead of the stuff that doesn't work, Mm. you know, and, and just notice, okay, well, um, I was able to like laugh at my, at, with my kid today, or I was able to, they came out and they were able to like, show me how to do eyeliner. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> right. And that's all it was. It wasn't, it wasn't more than that, but it wasn't not that, you know? Mm. And I think, I think that we always, that, that oftentimes us in human relationships, we're always wanting more and we keep noticing like the negative part of the relationship instead mm -hmm. of the positive tries. Yeah. Tries might be really small. Like you might have to put your magnifying glass on for the truck yeah. but they, they might if we don't notice them then then we're going to miss those little moments that our our kid might have been trying to open up to us right and like, how beautiful it is when when um for a kid when they get to teach their parents something i i feel like kids really light up when they feel like they're um they're like they're in a position of sharing something that they know um, and that can feel so empowering and, and that can really, I, I foster a lot of connection. Um, I mean, I've noticed that in therapy, especially with, with kids of all ages, when you give them some, some empowerment over like, this is what they know. And they're, they're sharing it with me. They're teaching me something new and to be receptive to that. Um, I think that can create such a, a good connection. Mm -hmm. So other, other thoughts about, you know, aside from what we've addressed already, which is like that. Yes, the change of like not knowing what the future will bring, celebrations being canceled, mm -hmm. um, not being able, the loss of not being able to, to see their peer group and hang out with their friends in person. Yeah. I know this is, this is a really challenging thing. Um, but also, what do you feel like some of the other things that might be making kids shut down right now? Yeah, I mean, yeah, all of that stuff. Um, Plus, uh, a lot of that developmental stuff that's also going on for kids, right? Um, but I think that I think that the social aspect of the, of being like stuck at home, um, I think it's really taking a toll on like pretty much everybody, <laughs> but especially for for young people um, who are used to being with their friends, you know, at school all day, um, and that's you know a huge part of of their development and um, of just what brings them like happiness and joy right now. Um, so trying to stay as connected as possible with, you know, video and phone chat, um, would be hopefully be helpful. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a, a weird, um, unprecedented time. And especially for these young people, it's, there's already so much going on for them, um, emotionally, cognitively, and then they're, you know, stuck inside and um, any, any kind of friction that may have been there, maybe with parents or family members, um, it's just going to be so amplified by, by being, you know, in the same space right now. Right. Um, and, and I think also just that, that kind of um, desire to have privacy is also going to be so amplified like that that was already there probably to some extent right. Um, but right now it's like okay we're in the same house I need like some amount of alone time to be with my thoughts and be with myself and um, so I think also not putting a lot of pressure um, you know to uh, putting pressure on kids to um, to I guess kind of do what you, you want them to do in this time too, like pressure to hang out, um, kind of let them, um, let them know that, that you care about them. You want to hang out with them, um, that you want to talk, you want to have an open relationship, you want to be connected. Um, and also let them like come to you, you know, um, I've also, I've, I've experienced, you know, especially in therapy situations with kids who are a little bit more shut down that, just having the inquisitive route of like making it feel like an interrogation does not work. <laughs> and so for parents, especially, you know, if you're just kind of bombarding kids with question after question after question, um, it can feel like this kind of interrogation, this gathering of information. Um, and it's probably not going to get you very far. 
And I know it's probably coming from a place of just wanting to know what's going on and wanting to connect, right? Um, but it, it kind of will lead kids to uh, retreat even more. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so letting them have some space so that they can come to you um, when, when they're ready to, you know, when they, when they feel like they can, they can show up and um, spend time with their parents. Mm-hmm. So it makes me think of a, a few things. Like one is that they're needing their peer group to identify with, like that's their developmental task, right? And if, um, and if they've had like extreme situations, like they didn't normally spend that much time with the family and they didn't normally spend that much time with each individual parent talking, that that wasn't the norm. And so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's too much to put that new expectation on them since that wasn't happening. Yeah. Uh, and the other piece is that pushing mm-hmm. them, and I love the coding, like the coding word could be used instead sort of to let them off the hook or to get yeah. them to communicate beyond the yes and no, yeah. uh, is probably if you push too hard, it's going to make them withdraw. Yeah. And then the parent, because um, I think it is, it's, it's challenging, especially in the same house where you see your child like the whole day withdrawn that it might be something that the parent works on how they're going to deal with that worry themselves yeah. because almost it's almost like what you said initially like the kid is going to watch the parent's response to things and if the parent is getting more and more intense around their response to like you're so you never talk to me then um the child's going to see like my parents not handling that very well right and, it, and it's almost like this reverse psychology like if they handle it better then the child will come towards, you know, Mm -hmm. if there's this intensity, like you have to talk to me, then the child's going to withdraw. So it's almost like that balance of the parent really working on like, how am I going to handle this situation where my child doesn't want to to talk to me Um, Mm -hmm. instead of, you know, taking it as rejection or taking it as um, something wrong with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say is that I'm, I'm also hearing feedback that kids are doing, some kids are doing better because that whole peer pressure, feeling slightly bullied, overstimulated in their school environment wasn't their best place. Like they're so much better being in isolation and not having to deal with the pressures of um, a social environment. Yeah, totally. I know I've, I've seen that too. And um, yeah, now that they've been at home, it seems like magically like most of their problems aren't there anymore. <laughs> you know, they're not seeing friends. They're not feeling that pressure. Uh, yeah, that those bullying situations. Um, so yeah, it's kind of it, it's varied, right? There's so many different situations. Some kids are really thriving in it, just like adults too. You know, we're all we all have our different ways of being in the world and being with ourselves, and so it's really it's yeah, it's quite different for for everyone. Right. So these, these are sometimes the, the indicators like, okay, maybe the anxiety that the child was experiencing was this real pressuring uh-huh. feeling of being in school and that that's not the best environment for them. So this is like almost note to self, like, have we been um, forcing our kid into a situation yeah. that's not been good for them? And that that might be something in the rethink of how we, yeah. like, I think we're all probably having a rethink about how we go back to the world. And yeah. maybe sometimes the, the lessons of what we've been able to see our kids do, you know, need more of and need less of is, is our like, good messages, good learning to, to, to have during this time, I think. Yeah, definitely. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess in summary is to talk about like what, what would be some of the sort of top 10 things you would tell a kid in this situation, a, a teen, a tween, and what are some of the top 10 things you tell a parent in the situation of COVID and being together all the time and things to, yeah, yeah, so, so these might kind of, these feel like a little, uh, like they're a little overlapped, um, because they kind of are interwoven into, to relationally what you can do, maybe both together or, or separately, right, um, I, first, I think it's really important to have a routine, to stick to the routine. Um, I think most kind of family units had some kind of routine uh, before all the pandemic. And so sticking to something that 
feels a little bit like that, right? Getting up at the same time, going to bed at the same time, um, still having meals together or, or maybe having meals together for the first time, right? Um, developing something that feels a little bit like normal um, and just having that structure can feel, can feel um, a little bit grounding, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also making space, I think we talked about this earlier, but making space for, um, for talking about the grief and the disappointment that could be coming up. Um, so for parents making space to talk about that with kids, to talk about the losses that they're experiencing. Um, like we mentioned, you know, we may not have these kind of typical social events like graduation and, or prom and, um, or, you know, birthdays or, you know, whatever it is that, that may look different and feel different. And, and maybe um, there's nothing that can really replace those losses. But just having the space for kids to be able to express that for their par- to their parents and have parents kind of validate that, mm-hmm. like, I'm so sorry. Yes, it's like, I hate that you had those losses. And like, I'm so sorry that it's frustrating. I'm so sorry that you had that. Um, so just really kind of validating their experience in, in this whole, this whole thing. Um, and with that too, I think engaging in, um, in deep listening. Uh, so, so for parents, especially, um, being really present with, with what their kids are saying, um, and really listening to the content of what are, what they're saying and, and validating their concerns, um, mm. And I think staying connected, we talked about this earlier, but staying connected, um, staying connected with, uh, you know, family members, um, friends, um, uh, other people in their classes, um, just anybody who's in your community. I think it's so important to maintain that thread to your community right now, even if it's just over a video, um, but to just have uh, people that, you know, that are important to you to, to talk to. Um, and to feel, to feel less isolated, you know, when you can't physically leave your house as much, um, you really need to maintain that. Uh, I think also movement, movement is so important for, for adults and for teens. Um, even in your own house, like doing a dance class over zoom, like so many things you could do together too, like a yoga class or, um, anything, you know, get creative with what you could come up with, but being able to, to continue to move your body around, maybe go on a family walk, you know, um, things that you can do to, to, to not just be stuck with, you know, the energy that's been kind of building up in your, in your body and in your space, right? So continue to move. Um, meditation, meditation's helpful for kids, helpful for teens, helpful for adults. Um, to be able to have that place of calm, a place where maybe you get, you know, a f- five minutes to yourself in a day um, to be able to, to reset, especially when you're feeling those, those overwhelming feelings as a parent or as a kid. Um, if you need a minute, if you're feeling overwhelmed or feeling really anxious to take a second, um, whether it's uh, outside or in a different room, like to just try to reset your emotions so that you can come back um, to a more centered, you know, conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, breathing room, just having, uh, giving kids a space to, um, to have that alone time um, so that they can be more centered and more comfortable um, to ease into the conversation with you as well. Um, like we mentioned earlier, having, uh, the space for silliness and play um, to try to shift that emotion that's, you know, probably kind of tense right now. Mm-hmm. Um, have a dance party, learn a song to perform as a family, you know, yeah. all these kind of creative things that maybe you weren't doing before. And um, I'm thinking as you're saying this, like, I, you know, I'm thinking, I'm picturing this teen that won't come out of their room, right? That's like, <laughs> and you know, and that that would be like a oh, rejecting of the meditation or the song or the dance party. But I think one of the things to, to remember as the model parent, right? Totally. Yeah. And do it yourself. And you can also say I'm in the living room, yeah. um, sitting and watching a movie, or I'm actually meditating right now, right before dinner, 
And like, and so the, yeah. the child starts saying, and you can join me or why don't you try, or maybe we can do it together or that's maybe we can do it, you know, an evening yeah. walk or mm -hmm. like that. Some of it would be coming from when you have, like sometimes we have resistance, right? From, from our family members to like do that thing that I was thinking about something that I was, that I read for parents who are trying to create more structure in their homes is to just pick one or two things to do a day that they, that you do consistently yeah. and then watch how it sort of ricochets into the family. Like if you have a better attitude and you're actually sitting and meditating and having breathing room and yeah. taking time alone in your room and you're like, you announce it like taking time alone in my room, you know, <laughs> Um, that people are going to notice that that you're doing that it gives permission for new behavior totally. right yeah mm -hmm. yeah and I, I think I've noticed that too like you know just being um, in therapy like if, if there's something that that I'm talking about or you know a new a new idea that I'm bringing up and and I don't fully believe in it like people are going to pick up on that like clients will pick up on that they'll and they won't want to do it either so if, yeah if parents are um, trying something new, but they're confident about it, or they're willing to try something new, the kids will pick up on that too, right? If they're like willing to be silly and kind of like um, engage in play and, um, and, and not, you know, worry about looking stupid or like failing at something, um, kids will also pick up on that too and, and maybe come out of their shell a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there. I think there's a lot of opportunity for different kinds of connection, yeah. and again, that's all taking into account that people aren't struggling struggling with their own survival, and they're not essential workers that are really stressed, and they don't have the bandwidth. And in some ways, you have to lean on other people when those things are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think if there is the bandwidth, and there's just basically the kind of a what would you call it? Uh, sort of a homeostasis a stress level, like everyone's used to that stress level. That's like the norm. Yeah. It's a little more intensified is probably like 10 or 20% more because of the COVID yeah. that to, to try to keep inserting, uh, or how can I pull in difference? How can I pull in positivity right. and, and then normalize some of the others? Cause it's not all that. It's also your child is going through a big developmental task, you know, yeah. to separate. Yeah. And that is their task. And so yeah. they are doing some of that. Yeah. And it's not all about COVID. It's not all about depression. Some of it's just right. a normal developmental stage. Totally. Yeah. Right. Any yeah. other final things that you might want to add to, um, to what you feel like you're doing or maybe you've noticed that's really helped mm. uh, when you see a kid being able to, to um, pull out of something or actually feel... I don't know, less anxious about the unknown future? Is anything come up in, in your head when I'm asking that? I, mean, I think, um, I think for me, like showing up and, and just being my kind of authentic self, um, so that I can join them, you know, and where they're at and they, they can pick up on that too. Um, and yeah, I think, for me, it's, it's, it's a delicate balance of, um, kind of not, not pushing too much, like holding a structure, um, but allowing for a little bit of freedom. Right. And I feel like that can uh, also be true for, for the families, right. Um, of, of creating the space for them to explore what's going on for them, um, mm -hmm. without, without pushing too much. Um, and, and so f a lot of times having, you know, the art can really be this bridge. Um, so I think for parents too, that can be really helpful to have um, something else to, to do um, that, you know, it won't just be like, let's just sit down and you tell me everything that happened to you today. Um, having something, something to do, something to do together, um, which it's really amazing. Like what can come out when you're just like, you're kind of working on a task together or you're working on an art project together. Um, all of a sudden, like things just, you know, start popping up for them, for the kids. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're, you know, willing to, to go there, you know, emotionally about something. Um, and it kind of happens, uh, a little bit organically. Um, instead of, you know, feeling this kind of immensity of like sitting with these emotions and, 
and just kind of vocalizing them, which can feel kind of daunting for kids. Um, so really, really, I can't stress enough, like doing something together, engaging in activity. Um, yes, yeah, so or have the focus be on the activity instead of the focus be on why aren't you talking to me? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I kind of like the way we all feel at the end of a, a walk, like we were, we're maybe we're, our thoughts were clearer. We, we actually maybe say more if the person's around, if there's a person around us, or we actually figured something out in our head. It's almost like the same right. organic, like creative process. You get, you go through an experience with someone and there is something to talk about. It's not just the focus on pressure on me to talk. Right. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. It's like two different sides of your brain's being activated, right? Like, especially when you're doing something creative, it's like the right side of the brain and um, you're in this kind of flow state and it can, it, it's kind of the emotional part of the brain, right? So right. naturally those things kind of come up, whereas like the other side, it's like, it's really rational, it's really intellectual and it's, um, it can maybe shut down a little bit more when you're trying to, to go into the emotions or it can shut down the other side. Um, so yeah, so doing something together can be so helpful. Right. And just for me to just empathize that other part is like, it is, I really have a lot of compassion for, for parents. It is very pressuring to feel like there's an unhappy mm -hmm. um, being in your house. that's not talking that you're worried about. It causes a lot of internal stress too. And that's really something to take care of and to also look at how it affects your relationships with them and with your yeah. partner and with the other kids in the house. Um, but that's why I think therapy and art therapy is so important because it actually helps kids practice. They have a, they have a place to practice um, acknowledging or just checking in with their feelings or learning about them. Mm -hmm. And then also because you're not emotionally involved with them mm -hmm. um, in terms of you're not raising them. So they can actually start practicing more having feelings with someone who's more neutral to them yeah. which means that they can, they're learning how to have feelings and have, emotional conversations right yeah, yeah yeah that's so important um that that therapeutic connection and um having that that neutral person outside of the family to process things with and and yeah i always like to stress that um yeah, that therapy isn't necessarily about like some kind of outcome right it's about building this relationship and and kind of learning those relationship skills so that you can um, figure out how you are in relationship and apply the to to your family unit and um, to you know future people that you're in relationship with. Mm -hmm. So that can be really important. Yeah. Yeah, and there's so many other things in this conversation that we didn't talk about, which are really important if people have questions ab about how to get their teen in therapy or mm -hmm. how to deal with um, issues that they might be really highlighted and, and concerned about, like safety issues or um, drug and alcohol use or whatever else might be in the picture with your teen, like those are things to check out. Those are things to make sure if you, if you feel concerned that you have some places where you're identifying or assessing those and that you don't like, you know, we, we know that there's a normal sort of framework here mm -hmm. of just being able to establish like family connections and communication, but then there may be things that your antenna is really up about you as a parent mm -hmm. that you need to really check out. And that's we'll right. be providing links below this talk so that you can get in touch with Chelsea, you get in touch with me and also know the things that I'm doing to help families during this time. And, mm -hmm. and hopefully um, everybody finds the right kind of support during this time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really want to thank you for, for coming on and just talking mm -hmm. about this, the connection with teens and helping normalize this and normalize what they're going through and different yeah. things that, that families might do. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> good. Okay. Well, I hope you come back again because I'm sure there'll be more issues that I want to check in with you about how you handle those <laughs> teens and their family. Yeah. yeah. Again, for just taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. I also wanted to hear a little bit about why you chose to, to, to work with this age group. Like, what is it about you and teens and tweens that is a draw? And then, and then maybe um, going into understanding that issue of, of yeah. parents and kids um, having difficulty connecting during this time. Yeah, yeah great. Um, well, I think this age group, I guess like the adolescent to teen um, spectrum it can be such an interesting and dynamic uh, 
time for kids. It's this threshold, right? You're going from, um, from maybe like middle school to high school or elementary to middle school, or, you know, child to adult basically. And there's just so many changes going on um, socially, physically, cognitively, like what's going on with your identity, your morals, like you're really, kids are starting to take shape around that age. And they're just um, receiving so many messages too. And especially now it's, uh, you know, nothing new. And, but now that there's all these like messages being bombarded at kids, especially with social media and um, just society, their peers, like there's just information constantly. They're getting messages about who they should be, what they should be, what they should wear, how they should talk. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot to filter. Um, so I think it's just a really kind of um, like f- vulnerable age to be at um, in this threshold of like really starting to develop your personality, you know, who you are, what you believe in. Um, all of that's taking shape. And um, so I think it's, it's uh, you know, a really interesting time um, for kids to do the work in therapy too, to have somebody to talk to about all this stuff. Um, and, and then too, I, I love this age group specifically for the way that I practice with art therapy as well, because it's so, um, ki- most of the kids in this age group are so receptive to it. They're like really kind of like having the capacity now to uh, think abstractly um, and feel abstractly. So they're able to kind of put that into their artwork. And, you know, sometimes communication can be um, a difficulty or knowing what their emotions are, right? And um, explicitly stating them. So we have this, you know, integrative approach, just tapping into that creativity uh, so that they can have this other way of understanding, making sense of what's going on for them, Um, which is so helpful for, I mean, especially the younger kids, the elementary age, some middle school kids, because they're still working all that stuff out. Like, what are emotions? And um, so for them, it's been really helpful to have this um, kind of this weaving of like talk and play, right, of um, starting a project, doing something tactile, um, and, then, and then words come, you know, and then they're able to kind of make sense or process what's going on for them. And it may be through metaphor um, or, or the artwork, but um, it's been really fascinating to see sort of what their internal processes and what they're putting out in the artwork. Um, So I did a lot of work with younger kids when I was was kind of getting started um, right after grad school and worked with like elementary age. So they were really, they were really open to art therapy and, um, you know, it it looked different because we would do a lot of play and, um, you know, sand tray and stuff like that. and then I moved into uh, working in eating disorders uh, at an eating disorder clinic here in the city. And so that was mostly with teenagers, uh, a lot of teenage females that I was seeing. So that, I feel like that experience really gave me uh, a sense of like what it's like to work with this, with this age group. Um, I like the idea that you're, I mean, I think that's a great modality of having art therapy because I think sometimes kids find it really intimidating to come to therapy and have to be like, I'm supposed to be talking about emotions. I don't even know what mine are, but then they yeah. can see the metaphor in their drawing or you can see it. And then there's, there's a, a thing to talk about, you know, yeah. so that's really, really great. So how do you,